This is the second session in the Arrow's Summer Philosophy series talking about the five ways to prove the existence of God according to St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and we are the Houston Arrows. We're a Catholic community who are committed to uh, help form men in virtue through competitive rugby. I may not have gotten the wording right, but here we are. Thank you. I mean, I've been around a while. Um, so uh, my background is in uh, is in youth ministry. So I was a youth minister for about eight or nine years. Um, I did my undergrad in theology and catechetics, uh, and my master's is in biblical studies. So that's more my expertise. So that's my like disclaimer. I currently teach theology at Straight Jesuit uh, to juniors and seniors. Um, so if I don't have to tell anybody not to touch each other, we're gonna have a good time. Um, you know, it's it's a little different experience for me um, because. Uh, I'm used to dealing with teenage boys uh, who have a little too much energy. Um, so yeah, so Aquinas, uh, it's like scholastic theology is not my expertise, but uh, hopefully we can we can hang. So for me, uh, I figured this is a good jumping off point. So I want to look at the actual text, put it in its context, and then go from there. So because I'm biblically minded, um, there's a document, the Second Vatican Council, De Verbum, all about revelation in scripture. And it talks about when we examine scripture, we always consider it within its context the unity of all of scripture, as well as a uh, sacred tradition or the living tradition of uh, Christianity, living tradition of the church. Uh, and then lastly, the, the analogy of faith. And basically this understanding that all of the doctrines of the faith illuminate one another. So we're going to talk about, all right, let's talk about God as the first mover. What else does that have to do with other things involving the faith? So we'll end with kind of like, so what does this have to do with us and our response to it? So we'll start with Aquinas' intellectual exercise and just kind of go from there. So feel free to ask questions at any point. I'm very used to that being interrupted uh, often very loudly and rudely. Um, so I will not be phased at all. Uh, in fact, it'll probably make me feel very at home. So starting with the outline, here we go. So the argument in context. So the Summa is short for the Summa Theologica or how you translate it. Sometimes you'll see it Summa Theologiae, which is just nerd. Um, but essentially, it was a text that Aquinas wrote. And so Aquinas is a scholastic theologian. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, why is that important? Because um, scholastic theology was kind of um, in the high Middle Ages, essentially, there was this way of approaching theology that was new. So the early church fathers were these cats that were just like trying to figure out what the heck does this mean? And they had to the Greek thought, which was important, which is one of the things that was pointed out to me years ago is fascinating, the timing of uh, the Christ event that God had, like at the time of the height of uh, the Roman Empire, at this point, like so much of the known world was speaking a common language. It was a great time to actually like, spread the gospel, which is fascinating because like everybody spoke Greek. So like, that's really cool. But they also had contact with Greek thought. And so they had to take these ideas revealed first in Hebrew, which if you ever study Hebrew, um, it's a very limiting language to try and reveal things. So it's interesting. That God shows that one. Um, but he does. He reveals to us. And then from there, uh, now we have Greek and Greek thought to even explain some of these concepts. Uh, and so that was just the early church was just kind of figuring out what words do we use, which you ever want to like wrinkle your brain. The word person uh, in and of itself is a religious term used to describe the Trinity. Like that's where that comes from. It's fascinating. So if you want to get into like hypostasis and all that stuff, we won't do that, but we could, but we won't. Um, and so the scholastics were able to take that specifically Aquinas and like build upon it. And so they were just building on everything that had been done before. And so after like the Council of Nicaea really had like Ambrose and Augustine, and then like Peter Lombard was like the guy. And then you have Aquinas. So the Summa was written for novices, which always makes me feel depressed because I have a hard time reading it. And you're like, this is for novices. But what that actually means in the Middle Ages, before you studied theology to teach theology, you actually completed what we would call the equivalent of like a master's degree in philosophy. So you already had all your philosophy and now you're studying theology. So this is written for Dominican novices who already know how to like speak this language and use these terms. Um, and so it's kind of this massive text um, and an overview of it. And so it's scholastic in that it uses question uh, and answers. And that's really how the scholastics did it. Is they're big on asking questions and then like making you do it. And so I say all of this because it helps hopefully us read Aquinas a little bit. And so if you look at the sheet that uh, Blake printed out, it's actually very clean, which is nice. The text I was looking at to prepare for this isn't this neat. So the way Aquinas uh, breaks down the Summa is it's there's three parts. And so we have the first part, and then we're looking at, because there's two parts to the second part. So that's a little confused. People talk about the, the first part of the second part, which is obnoxious, but that's how it's arranged. And then there's questions. And then with each question, there's articles. And then he goes through and he answers those said questions. So if you look on the outline, uh, we're looking at the first part, question two, whether God exists. Article three, 
the five ways. And if you want to be a real nerd, you'll see the citation there. That's how people cite it. One, Q, two, A, three. So there you go. But um, the way Aquinas does this is important is he first raises objections. So he asks the question whether God exists, and then he poses two objections to the existence of God, anticipating what this invisible interlocutor, this person I've been arguing with, would say. Uh, which is actually very similar to what Paul does, which is why sometimes Paul is hard to read in the New Testament because it sounds like he's arguing with them because he is. He's arguing with somebody who's not there. And so he presents their case. And you're like, is he contradicting? No, he's, uh, and Aquinas isn't that intense. Um, and then he goes through and he says, you know, on the contrary, which in the Latin, ad contras, right? I'm going to say, here it is. And then he's going to lay out his argument and then he's going to go back in the end and he's actually going to raise replies to each objection. So it's very thorough. But it's important to highlight that because otherwise Aquinas gets very confusing very quickly. You're like, why is he starting? What does he mean objection? Um, because is it the court of law? Like, no, he's just being Aquinas. Um, so the other thing to talk about is, so this, the argument of the, the, the five ways to prove God exists uh, is based in natural uh, philosophy or sometimes it's called cosmology. It's an older term for it. So what Aquinas is doing is he is saying, apart from divine revelation, so through human reason alone, we can come to the conclusion that there is a God, that there's evidence. And these are his five arguments for how through the human experience, we can agree there must be a God. Um, now it's important to highlight, of course, this is not Aquinas' own invention. It actually predates him quite a bit, as does this argument. The, uh, the first mover is actually much older than Aquinas. However, when we talk about it and the way we're going to read it and the language he's going to use is going to be steeped in natural philosophy. And we'll explain more about that. We actually go through the text because he's going to use terms um, that are very common terms, but we don't use them the same way. The Greek philosophers came that conclusion, right? Aristotle. Exactly. Which, those are the three big A's, man. Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas. There you go. Um, that's where like most Catholic uh, philosophy comes from. So we'll just jump in and we're going to look first at the... Um, the actual text, um, starting at the, the, I answer that because we don't want to, um, we'll start with on the contrary. I'm not going to get the objections just yet. And we're going to look at the first one because that's what we're talking about tonight. So Aquinas says, on the contrary, it is said in the person of God, I am who am, uh, which I think is fascinating. He quotes Exodus 3 here, and we'll talk about why I think that's fascinating later. Um, and he answers that the existence of God can be proven in five ways. The first and more manifest way is the argument from motion. It is certain and evident to our senses that in the world some things are in motion. Now, whatever is in motion is put in motion by another, for nothing can be in motion except it is in potentiality to that towards which is in motion, whereas a thing moves in as much as it is in act. Now, this is where people go, you lost me already. And that's okay if that's how you feel. Because what Aquinas is building upon is Aristotle's definition for motion. Uh, so when we think motion, most people think locomotion, things moving from place to place. But for Aristotle, and then Aquinas sticking up, motion is actually a movement through a form, you could argue it, but just a movement from a state or a place to a terminus. So yes, locomotion counts, right? Pick up the ball, throw it to Ben, that's motion. But also aging is considered motion. Growing is considered motion. Um, and so anything from potentiality to act. And he's going to give a couple examples that will make hopefully more sense, but that's important to understand. We talk about motion. This is all that is included. And so he'll explain potency uh, a little bit with, um, with wood and fire. So he says, nothing can be reduced from potentiality to actuality, except by something in a state of actuality. Thus, that which is actually hot as fire makes wood, which is potentially hot to be actually hot and thereby moves and changes it. Now, in simple terms, Fire is hot and it makes other things hot, except if the thing's already hot, fire can't make it hotter than the fire is, right? So you have to have the potential to be hot. And I'm sure there are substances in the known world that like don't really get hot, like they're very resistant to heat. I'm assuming there are some that are maybe even incapable of becoming hot, but that's what it means. So you, have the, you have to have the potentiality and it's by motion, we move moving from the potential to be hot to becoming hot. So you have a piece of wood, you light it on fire, and then as it burns, the wood becomes hot. Now, those of us who are more scientifically minded be like, well, I don't know if it's the wood that becomes hot, but rather you know, the process of combustion gives off heat, which is energy. Again, this isn't scientific. This is natural philosophy. And so this idea of potency and potentiality uh, is really important for us to understand. And the way to think about it, and we're going to get into this idea of like God is existence, right? So things exist because they first have the potential 
to exist, right? So the idea of like nothing, we can speak about the concept of nothing, but nothing doesn't actually exist because existence is a thing. So you can't really have nothing, absolutely. Does that make sense? Because we all have, here's like the fact that there's potency is potency. So you have to have the potential to move. And so all things in motion, he's gonna argue next, must first be put in motion by something else that has the capacity to do it, i.e. is already in motion. And he's gonna use the word potentiality a lot to say essentially, if you aren't in motion, which he's gonna call act, you haven't moved from potency to act, you can't act upon something else. Everybody with me so far? Fantastic. So he's gonna say then, if we're gonna go back, everything already in motion must first have a mover. And since you can't put yourself into motion by yourself, because in order to move from potency to act, the thing moving you must already be in act, then there needs to be a mover, so on and so forth, ad infinitum, right? All the way back, but there must be a beginning because if there's no beginning, then there can't be a first mover and nothing was ever put into motion. Therefore, he's, and his, his summary, this is my favorite thing, the last sentence, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover put in motion by no other, and this everyone understands to be God. And I just love, he just like lands the plane. Again, because this is written for Dominican novices, they're like, yes, we understand that. We're kind of like, are you sure? It could be something else. Um, but essentially, that's the argument, right? So everything that we know to be in motion, not just like spinning through the galaxies, but the ability to act and act upon, to live, to exist, to grow, must have a beginning. Now, I have to kind of stop here because otherwise I'm going to start getting into contingency and in the next couple of weeks, and I don't want to step on people who have to present. Um, I'm not a teacher, so if you got to put third way, it's not going to be worth my third. <laughs> So anyways, like I said, this uh, predates uh, Aquinas. This actually is based on Aristotle and the ancients uh, were the first ones to come up with this idea. Um, and so Aris, uh, Aquinas picks it up and he builds upon it, which is great. Um, but I also threw on the outline there a quote from the Catechism, the Catholic Church, uh, which also talks about this idea that uh, the world starting from movement, becoming, contingency, and the world's order and beauty, which essentially is the next four of the five as well, uh, can come to a knowledge of God as the origin and end of the universe. So to land the plane on what Aquinas is talking about. He says, if we look around and we think about these things, because that's what philosophers do, uh, had to come from somewhere, essentially. But specifically, it had to be put into motion. It had to have a genesis. And if we're going to go back, the very first thing to move all other things must put everything into motion, right? Including like time itself. And if this first thing is the first mover, the unmoved mover, then he must even be outside of time because how can you start time from being inside time? And so it leads us back to what the ancients had already surmised that there is a God who is supreme and who is infinite and is the first mover. All right, so what the heck does this tell us about God? Uh, so first and foremost, uh, it would come back to Aquinas's uh, big famous statement. He calls God the ipsum essa. Essentially, it's Existence itself, or like the act of acting, is like the, the way to translate the Latin there. And so for Aquinas, God is the source of all existence, right? He, uh, everything comes from God, and then everything returns to God. Um, but he's the one who puts everything into motion and then keeps it uh, in motion. Um, so it's important to highlight, I'll just do the now, objection number one, because this is fascinating to me, and I think it fits with this one, because these objections, of course, apply to all five. But the first one is, he says, uh, it seems that God does not exist, because if one of two contraries be infinite, the other would be altogether destroyed. But the word God means that he is infinite goodness. If, therefore, God existed, there would be no evil discoverable, but there is evil in the world, therefore, God does not exist. This also is not a new idea. Um, the ancients had this argument as well. If God is good, then why is there evil? It means he's not all-powerful, therefore, he can't be God. And, you know, we're not going to get into the problem of evil right now. But um, Aquinas' point is, if God is infinitely good, how can there still be evil in the world? Like, So how can we have this first mover? Because uh, if he's infinite, and he is infinitely good, which he is, how is there still evil? Because how could it exist next to something that is infinite how can you have infinite good and evil why does he assume that he's infinitely good that's a great question and it's not going to be answered here and i, I have to come back. <laughs> you'll have to come back or talk to somebody who's an expert in like thomistic thought um so that's a great question it's a very big part of the right so the, the five ways kind of explains the existence of god and then he actually starts going through and using the same type of logic starts uh identifying different qualities of god and then he starts going through the the ultimate infinite goodness actually is one of the qualities 
You can probably find it on the internet for free. It's just, <laughs> you have to know how to navigate it. You know, we're in the first part, second question. So go to the third one um, and you'll find it. Um, sorry, so I don't know Aquinas's answer to that question. Um, but his answer, if you flip to the back of the sheet, his answer actually, he quotes Augustine. And the answer is uh, amazing. The language that Aquinas uses, it cracked me up when I was reading it earlier. He's, as Augustine says, since God's the highest good, he would not allow any evil to exist in his works unless his omnipotence and goodness were such as to bring good, even out of evil. This is part of the infinite goodness of God that he should allow evil to exist and out of it produce good, um, which take that with a grain of salt, if you will. Um, but it lines up with scripture. That's one of my favorite passages. Romans 8.28 says that um, God works good for all things um, according to his will for those who love him, right? Uh, so there's my background coming into play. So my answer is take it up with Paul. Um, ties in with free will too, obviously. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Wouldn't have a free will otherwise. Right, you wouldn't have free will. Um, so there you go. Now, what does this tell us about God? So God is existence itself, um, but also there are interesting Trinitarian implications when we think about this idea of like movement, right? So he's the first mover. It means nobody put him into motion, but it doesn't mean that God isn't moving. Um, and so when you get into Aquinas's Trinitarian thought, he begins to talk about the way that Godhead works. So bear with me here, because this is going to be like a dive into some insanity um, and hopefully not material here. So it's really easy to get God wrong. You start talking about the imminent Trinity. But essentially, how can we have one God and three persons, right? And so the best way I found to explain it, it starts with Augustine had uh, what we call the psychological analogy, right? So human beings to be a person is to have free will. And an intellect, right? You can think, you can reason, and you can will. So according to Augustine, God, who's perfect, knows himself with such um, perfection that in knowing himself, it actually creates, it begets another person. And that's the first procession, the divine logos, the second person, the Trinity. And then in loving himself, which is an act of the will, we have the Holy Spirit. And so um, Aquinas takes that and does like a deep dive and basically looks at then we have relations between these three persons, these three hypostases that are eternally begotten. Um, but the question is, how can we have three if God is one and God does not change? And that was Arius's big snafu. How can we have like an incarnation if God doesn't change? Uh, and we go back to philosophy and Aristotle will talk about what you call an imminent action because I can will things and that's an action, but it's within my person, like to think, to love, to make a decision doesn't change me, but it happens interiorly. And so they're imminent actions of God. Uh, and so uh, Aquinas goes from there then to these relations. You have Father, Son, and Spirit, or you have the, the first person, the Trinity, the second, the divine Logos, and the third, uh, and how they're real relations, not relations of opposition. So God is not simply, like the Father is not simply not the Son, and the Son is not not the Father, but they're actually who he is, is the Father. And the second person is the divine Logos, is the Son, as is the third, is the Trinity. And then from there, you get into his processions. Because for Aquinas, there are four processions within the Godhead. The love between the Father and the Son, and then from the Son to the Spirit, and then the Spirit back to both the Father and the Son. And so Aquinas talks about relations, persons, and processions. And all of this is an eternal movement within God, who is the first mover. There you go. So that was just something I thought about looking at this. I know it's super nerdy. We don't have to get into the weeds because Trinitarian theology is crazy, um, but it's super fun. If, if you want to nerd out, And a couple times a week, we put out some talks, and there was actually one about trying to bring together divine simplicity with this idea of Trinity. If you want the details, really understand like the original understanding of the universal plan, this would be very useful. What you call it? It's Mystic Institute? Yeah, Mystic Institute is the name of the overarching group of monthly institutions. They travel around, it's actually more geared towards college campuses, like we've done a lot of college campuses and give talks, but they're all recorded in the oh, okay. podcast. What, what do you think of the Paul said about the Trinity? You know, the Bible says, first of all, God is love. Mm -hmm. God is love eternally. He is equated with love. And that makes perfect sense with the Trinity because the Father eternally loves the Son. Eternally, you know, the Holy Spirit eternally loves the Father and the Son. And this happened always, forever. Right. And long before there were, you know, we didn't even say back then, but even it doesn't need even humanity to be eternally loved. Uh, if you have a perfectly singular God without the persons, before creation, what does he really love? 
that out of this outpouring of love, it's natural that he would create. Yeah. He's always loved and he wants family beyond that. He wants the created order and so forth. And so to me, uh, when I was younger, I learned about the Trinity and it was always kind of, it seemed kind of academic and dry. And then it wasn't until I got older I realized that the eternal aspect of love naturally falls out of the Trinity where it does it just the Well said. I think that goes back to maybe the answer to Jason's question about why do you assume God is good? First uh, John 4, God is love. God is defined by his attributes. You know, God is love, love is good. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, sure, absolutely. Yeah, and so, and, I mean, the scripture is self authenticated. So, right. Um, so you have that. Right. As well. And so, so you can uh, turn to that to point to. Why do we assume God is good? Because God told us He is good. Yeah. And, and, and so, um, and I know that's more philosophical than scholastic. Yeah. Or well, Aquinas is, is approaching it from a different end. It kind of yeah, right. It, it, that that uh, angle of it looks good. Yeah, and uh, C.S. Lewis talks about how uh, love needs an object. Yes. <clears throat> so, uh, kind of like what you're talking about. I also love Lewis's argument in *Mere Christianity* against the dualism. How there must be one God and He must be good, um, which is fascinating. Say what? I need to read that. Oh, it's such a good one. Um, all right, so now we'll pivot and we'll turn away from natural philosophy and dive into a little bit more of Revelation. That's more my wheelhouse. This is what excites me. So if we're talking about God as the first mover. We got to go back to the origin. Say, okay, so how does this apply to Christ? Because what Father Gregory talked about last week so good, so well. Because God is good. Um, was this idea of everything for Aquinas is the shape of Christ? He's like the shape of. Um, everything of existence itself, everything is according to Christ, which is important. And that's more like, what does that have to do with you and me? Because we can sit here and talk about whether or not God is evident to us. Oh, I forgot to talk about epistemology. We'll circle back to that. Um, it's for you, man. Oh, it's for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we'll look at scripture. So I think it's fitting that Aquinas says, yes, we can say God exists. And he points to Exodus 3 when God gives uh, his name, right? Uh, but also because of the summary, I am who am, and he's going to call God existence itself. And so, of course, of course, God exists. We wouldn't exist if there wasn't a God, according to Aquinas. And these are the reasons why. If we trace all of this back through study of creation by reason alone, there must be a creator. Uh, but luckily enough for us, this creator has revealed himself to us uh, through the sacred scriptures. And so Exodus chapter 3, Moses is there, and God gives us his name, which we call the Tetragrammaton, for those of us who uh, want a good Scrabble word uh, back at home. Uh, and this is the divine names, four Hebrew letters, uh, which are transliterated into YHWH, which is often pronounced Yahweh, though we don't actually know if that's how it's pronounced because it's a crazy word. Um, but it's essentially God revealing, I am who am, right? Uh, and scholars think it might be a present participle word of um, the Hebrew word haya, which is basically to exist. So very similar to Aquinas' take on it. So how does Aquinas arrive at uh, the ipsum essa? Well, it's kind of what God says in Exodus 3, which I think is super cool. Um, and so it's the God who is the first mover is the one who creates ex nihilio, out of nothing, because you can't have nothing. What was in the beginning? God. And then from God comes all things. And if he isn't all powerful, then he can't create out of nothing, right? Uh, and so we see that in scripture, uh, but also connected to the word. So John 1, John begins his gospel uh, echoing Genesis in the beginning, right? Uh, except in Greek, not in Hebrew. Uh, and so in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he introduces Christ as this divine logos, which is like the next step from the first mover, who is this God? He's wisdom itself. And we can get into all the different theology behind John's use of the word Logos, because there's a ton from the Stoics uh, and even from the Old Testament, their use of the word of God in the Old Testament, as well as in the Babylonian uh, Talmuds and Targums, and extra biblical Jewish literature, which is Chandler's favorite. Um, we have this idea of line Logos, but uh, not only that, the Ancient of Days is something that fascinates me as well. So I threw this on. There's something that I came across a few years ago, blows my mind. So uh, Daniel chapter seven, we're introduced to this mysterious figure called the son of man. Um, and why does this fascinate me? Because in the synoptic gospels, Jesus' favorite title to apply to himself is the son of man. Where the heck does that come from? Well, it comes from Jewish thought. And so I had made slides with the quotes on there. So I'll just read it to you because I don't have the slides up right now. But in Daniel chapter seven, um, the prophet Daniel uh, is in Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar is having these dreams. He's the king and Daniel have to interpret my dreams. And he has this dream. 
And in it, he sees these four beasts that represent four kingdoms. And each beast is superior and scarier than the last. And they represent, they can, we can get into which kingdoms you think they are. But after the kingdoms comes the Ancient of Days. This is from Daniel chapter 7, starting in verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. And so when Jesus, which is the, the face, right, of the, the invisible God, the visible representation of the invisible God, refers to himself as the son of man, he's referring to the one who will be given dominion, authority over the kingdom that shall not pass away from the ancient of days, the first mover. Uh, and it's fascinating because when Jesus talks about it, and in Jewish thought, he was considered a divine figure. I don't remember if it's Mark or Matthew. I think it's Mark. Uh, when being questioned by the high priest, who do you say they am? He says, you'll see the son of man uh, ascending with his angels. And the high priest tears his garments uh, and says it's blasphemy. Well, why is he blaspheming if he's calling himself the son of man? Because the son of man was understood to be divine. Now, the next wrinkle, we're talking about the beginning of things, let's talk about the end of things. In Revelation chapter 1, John has a vision of Christ, and he is presented as this weird kind of um, hylomorphism of the two, since we're going to use Greek words. And so this is uh, John 1, verse 12. Sorry, John 1, Revelation 1, verse 12. Um, In the midst of the lamp stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as wool, white as snow. His eyes burned like a flame of fire. Uh, And so we didn't read that part of Daniel 7 when he describes the Ancient of Days, but he's described as having white hair and a beard and sitting on a throne with wheels of fire. And so now Jesus is represented as both the Son of Man who looks like the Ancient of Days. So what does it mean for you and for me is that oftentimes when we approach um, Christ in the Gospels, uh, it's easy to uh, emphasize his humanity, as we should he was fully man he was human but our god is not just a bearded hippie he's not just the one who you know, i mean in, you know he was, in, he was nice don't get me wrong he's love but he's the eternal one uh and so really what does this mean for you and for me well, it means a couple of things first if god is the first mover the creator of all things existence itself then our origins are found in god uh and so romans chapter 8 verse 29 um about 28 earlier, Paul says that he predestined from the beginning that all of us would be conformed to the image of his son. And so we're being conformed. That's that's our destiny. And so if we're talking about the first mover, what does it mean for you and for me? Well, then to understand who we are, we have to understand who God is, because that's where we come from. And so not only is that our origin, it's also where we derive our very identity, right? That's why you and I are here. Uh, And furthermore, then the very way we understand reality itself is shaped by this God who created it. And so our whole understanding of existence, humanity, needs to be shaped by that. Um, And so more of my theological formation came from uh, just kind of the the thought and philosophy of like a Luigi Giussani, uh, who was an Italian priest in the 50s, who wrote a book called The Religious Sense. And so similar to Aquinas, these things are self-evident. He says, if you look at the core of man is his desire to seek his creator, right? This desire as human beings uh, to have this innate religious sense, because that's what we're created for. And so all of reality is shaped by this understanding um, and just our search for meaning, which brings us lastly to then, so what does it mean for you? I mean, what's our response? Our response then is to try and connect with this creator, the one who is ancient, the eternal one, the God who was, who is, who is to come, who is vastly interested in you and the everyday minutia of your life which is weird because we can talk about these big things. We can crack a beer and philosophize and it's good and it's fun and we should, and it's fitting. And everything that Father Gregory said applies, right? That it's just an intellectual exercise in and of itself that's good for you as a person. We talked about these intellectual virtues help you grow. But what's crazy is this infinite being who's infinitely good that we're talking about uh, cares about how you feel about what you have for breakfast and the traffic on the way here today because he just is desperately in love with you. And that should blow your mind more than anything. Uh, But that's what Christ reveals to us. And so that's like the final wrinkle in the shape of all of it. So what's our response? Is to try try and connect with them. I was going to share a quote from the catechism about how basically a life of prayer is just communing with the triune God, but it's on the slide, so it's not the handout. But there's a quote from a book uh, written by a man named Jim Beckman, really helped me in my prayer life. And he said, and I loved it, if you want to know who you are and why you're here, start praying every day. And that's it. Because that's what this is about. We're connecting with the prima movens, the primus moments, right? The first mover, 
And so you exist, you're here, you're in motion. And that's evidence that you're loved because you still exist. Uh, and the purpose of life is to get to know that first mover. So there you go. I know it's a lot, it's very quick, but since we're here, let's have a conversation. And I really appreciate the conversation we had so far. So that's all I prepared to cover. Anybody have any further thoughts, questions? One thing I read on the, the Sun and Andrews, mm -hmm. I found that really interesting. I just kind of did a deep dive on it. And the, in the Old Testament, you'll see Son of Man given a few times here on the Eden Red. It's always a Son of Man. The first time it's the first time it's used as a title is by Jesus, and he says, "Be Son of Man." Mm -hmm. And that's in, in all of known literature, he's the first person to give himself that title, "Be Son of Man." That's right. Even though there's a Son of Man. Yeah, if you look in the book of Enoch, I think Enoch is the one that also talks about the Son of Man. Um, but in Daniel 12, the Son of Man is this corporate representative for all of the saints, as Daniel describes it, who's going to suffer on their behalf as a means of bringing the kingdom. Not to get into soteriology right now, but you add that to Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant, those servant songs in Isaiah. And all of a sudden, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. You're like, look out, because you're about to die, but do something crazy. Daniel 12 also loosely talks about um, resurrection, so... Again, it's nothing to do with Aquinas, but that's where I'm much more comfortable. So, an easy way to sum it up with your your uh, trying to explain that to somebody and they're not get it, you just say something can't come from nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Well, with the the God, you know, the God part or whatever. Oh yeah. So it gives mass to things, and that's almost like what you're saying it's the mover because they discovered the god particle by accelerating the particles and as they approached the speed of light they became heavier in mass so they theorized that there was something that was that was creating that and then that's the god particle so it's it's that first mover like you say because it's what it's what gives helium its mass it's what gives everything it's it's being you know so yeah. And another thing with the uh, the references of Jesus in the Old Testament, the Son of Man is just one of many. Like there's oh yeah that I did a few years when I first started coming back to the church. I um, I read about uh, Jesus in the Old Testament, and that was one of the most fascinating aspects. It's like uh, even in, in Proverbs. Talks about he danced with the uh, with men, and, and, and before we were ever created, it, we were like his his we yeah. were created for him. Mm -hmm. And before one day came into existence, he knew us all. It's just that that was a really fascinating. Thing. All right, that's good stuff. Okay, so I will officially end the recording, and we'll just keep chatting because it's gonna be a long thing to do.